for giving me opportunity to speak here. Um, the talk will be about the following aspect. So when you do climate modeling, you necessarily need to use a lot of compute power and simulation power in order to uh, make progress because we have don't have a chance of modeling Earth in the laboratory. So computation and therefore mathematical modeling is, is a key ingredient in climate research. Now, <clears throat> whenever any of us can, can, can this, uh, I, I see a window and that says it's being recorded and it doesn't go away. Even Somehow. if you click on open. Oh, okay, got it. Ah, yeah, okay, now I have it. Um, right, so um, mathematicians are not climate researcher, researchers, however, although many mathematicians who are active in the field do mathematics as well as physical modeling, as well as climate modeling, and it's a very interdisciplinary activity. And this talk is to focus on the question, when you think of generically mathematical contributions, what is there mathematics contributes to climate research? Not doing climate <clears throat> research per se, but contributing mathematical aspects to it. That's what I would like to phrase, for, uh, frame from, from my experience. Um, the talk will have three parts. The first is from basically my home turf. It's multi-scale geophysical flow modeling. The second part is on the analysis of complex data having a lot to do with the most hot topic today, machine learning, etc. And the last one is about language barriers, which is something that's probably the most exotic of the three topics. Um, before I start, let me thank uh, Ilya Horenko and Cesar Ionescu, who are the, the key authors behind the second and the third topic, respectively, <clears throat> that I will be speaking of. And then I would like to thank uh, Deutsche Forschungsgemeinschaft and the European Center for Medium Range Weather Forecasting who have uh, paid my bills and allowed me to interact with uh, active um, atmosphere ocean modelers for quite a number of years. Um, so let's dive in. Multi-scale geophysical modeling. When you look at <clears throat> um, pictures like the one on the top right, you look at the weather maps in the evening, or you look at outputs of climate models, then um, you realize that uh, phenomena in climate come on diff very different lengths and time scales typically. And when you open textbooks of uh, um, climate modeling meteorology or research papers, then you find that basically behind each of the pictures, there's a different set of equations. And even though they, for example, in the pictures I showed, all of them address atmospheric flows that is basically has one core description that we all believe in, and I will show it in a second, the equations often used in practice are very different uh, from the, the full-fledged compressible flow equations. And also in their mathematical character, they are very different. While uh, the top left has still three-dimensional fluid dynamics, but has an approximation to get rid of uh, annoyance of sound waves, which don't play a, a, a role in, in, in meteorology. The second one is just a scalar transport equation for something called a potential vorticity. And you, in the equation, you, you see the velocity field only as a, an advecting field here in the U. And basically you advect the scalar and the rest, once you have the scalar uh, of the flow state is reconstructed by solving elliptic equations on the fly. And so math the mathematical character of these equations is obviously very different from uh, the ones here or the ones I will show next that are believed to be the fundamentally valid equations for the atmosphere. And then in climate models or reduced climate models, it becomes all even more compressed and uh, compact. So when I entered the fields in 1997, joining the Potsdam Institute for Climate Impact Research, I was challenged with, um, on the one hand, uh, telling the climate researchers at the Potsdam Institute what mathematics could contribute, and on the other hand, telling my friends in the math department 
what the hell the climate researchers were doing. And so um, the question that I asked myself was, uh, one of the questions was, how can I reconcile all these different model equations that I'm faced with in the uh, research papers and, and textbooks of meteorology? How can I reconcile this with the fact that we all believe that air is a compressible medium that should, just, should satisfy the compressible flow equations that I have written down here with momentum balance uh, in the horizontal and vertical, with a mass, balance, mass conservation law, with um, uh, some form of the energy equation, and then possibly with additional components that describe chemical components in the atmosphere, cloud formation, uh, moist processes, et cetera, et cetera. And similar statements could be made for the for the oceans. So how does all the how do all the simplified models relate to this system? And then I remembered my studies in mechanical engineering, where basically similarity theory is a key topic because it allows you to scale from nature, where you have huge airplanes, air is flying around to scale them down to the laboratory scale and conduct experiments on miniaturized uh, airplane models and still draw conclusions with respect to the real thing. And what's behind it? Way, and now I told myself, what I don't like about the papers in meteorology is that what you get presented in order to go to the simplified model that is finally used in the paper, you get a mixture of qualitative arguments that basically the diameter of a high and low pressure system is a thousand kilometers. So I use that as the length scale and I'm interested in the evolution or prediction over one day. So this is my time scale. So in basically then based on these lengths and time scales, the equations are taken and simplified. And that's what you you, you get typically with, with some uh, nice, um, detailed derivations, but what I didn't like about it is that the, the origin of the argument is the specific phenomenon that's being studied, but not a, the generic setup of the atmosphere as such on Earth, which is what we should start off with. We should start off with scaling arguments that are independent of any particular phenomenon we want to study, and nevertheless be able to end up with reduced model equations that capture what happens on the different lengths and time scales automatically. And this is what I'm going up after in this talk. So we start doing the scale analysis with quantities of influence that are independent of any particular phenomenon on Earth, but are universal for all the phenomena in the atmosphere. This is radius of Earth, Earth rotation rate, acceleration of gravity, the sea level pressure, which is constant because the air cannot escape the gravity field, and so the mass is constant, and that's why the weight of the atmospheric column stays basically constant um, in time. The reference temperature is basically a result of the long-term balance of radiation between the sun and earth and the rest of the universe, and you end up with 250 Kelvin if you neglect water, if you put the water vapor that's the biggest greenhouse house effect. You pump it up to about 270 Kelvin, and then the rest of it comes from the other greenhouse gases. Um, and then we have uh, another important ingredient is the latent heat of condensation of water vapor um, that's captured in this number. And all of these quantities, they appear in whatever you study in terms of phenomena in the atmosphere. So those form a set universal set of uh, quantities of influence, which we can now use to do dimensional analysis. In other words, to form dimensionless parameters that characterize unique, uh, universally any flow on, uh, in the atmosphere on Earth. And you can combine them, all these quantities, into three parameters in particular um, that have a physically nice interpretation. This is the pressure scale height, the height over which the pressure drops by a factor of the Euler number, divided by the radius of Earth. Earth, that's a very small number, and that is um, uh, basically indicating that the atmosphere is a very thin shell over the, the sphere. Then the second quantity is basically the 
the latent heat of condensation covered in a saturated air parcel near the ground um, in the, uh, near the tropics divided by the internal energy at the reference temperature. Um, or the temperature change you would get if you condensate all the, the, the water vapor out of a parcel of air. And that's about a tenth of the reference temperature. So it's actually 30 Kelvin change of temperature that you would get if you evaporate out all the water vapor. And so that's an, another dimensionless and small number. And then the third one here is sort of funny. It's the reference isothermal sound speed divided by the speed of points on the equator due to a rotation of Earth. That turns out to be about one half. So when you are at the equator, you are zooming around at twice the sound speed, Mach 2. Um, of course, we don't not notice because the air is rotating with us. So it's, uh, it's more a, a, a funny fact, but, but it's a fact. And now, an important uh, aspect of forming scaling theories or asymptotic theories, as I would uh, call them, is that typically when you have many, in this case, three small parameters around, it doesn't make any sense to try to do a general asymptotic expansions in multiple parameters in the sense of a Taylor series or the sophisticated version of it. Why? The reason is that in all generality, the limit you get depends on the pass and the pass in the parameter space. So you don't have a um, Fréché derivative with respect to all these parameters at the origin in the, in the parameter space. No, it doesn't exist. What exists is different limits depending on how you approach the origin in the space of the small parameters. And it forces you to pick what is called distinguished limits or coupled limits between the parameters, and then study how does the system behave when you move with this, this remaining parameter epsilon into the origin. It's a generalization of the Gateau derivative, the directional derivative, which we know exists under more general conditions than the general Fréché derivative, which would indicate the existence of at least the first term of a Taylor extent. Okay, so we do, pick a distinguished limit. And this is basically compatible with these numbers. And this particular version um, has stood the test of time. And I will maybe get back to the square root of epsilon down here later on in the talk. So well, once I have this small question, parameter, yes. So that, I mean, there's possible that there's probably more combinations that you could choose between all those um, yeah, you know, um, variables. Um, can absolutely. you comment on what prompted but this? What I did is to begin with, I picked something that seemed re reasonable. And I said 0.5, I don't call it a small number. This is order one. And mm -hmm. I went all the way through the whole thing, came almost to the end. But then at the end, I found there's an obstacle. Um, let me give you the inside of you. In Pedlowski's book, when he derives the quasi-geostrophic equations, he has a one-liner there, which says, by the way, the external Rossby radius is by square root of epsilon smaller, uh, larger than the synoptic scale. When I ended up having picked a unity here, order one here, it turned out the external Rossby radius is by ep one over epsilon larger than the synoptic scale. And so it's planetary. Mm -hmm. So this didn't match his intuition. And I wanted to be true to what the meteorologists know. And I went back through all of this to the origin. And I found out if you scale this guy as square root of epsilon, then the external Rossby radius is in the middle of the planetary scale and the synoptic scale. And then I had captured basically everything I've ever seen in these papers. And now I'm able to reproduce what I will show you later on. And this is basically how I, in the end, fixed this particular one out of, I agree with you, many possible options. If you pick a different version of this, you basically go to a different family of planets in the universe. <laughs> okay, let me move on. So once I have the small epsilon, I can go back and say, how do all the classical non-dimensional parameters of theoretical meteorology, like food numbers, Rossby numbers, the Mach number, et cetera, relate to my small epsilon, and I get unique powers that are making up that relation. So I can basically translate what I do into 
the papers in meteorology and back. And I can also identify the, what is often called as the scaling lengths, or uh, as I mentioned it earlier, the Rossby or synoptic length scale here is often taken as the diameter of a, of a weather system uh, in, in what is called is, is, uh, the, the quasi-geostrophic theory derivation. Um, and I can relate it now to my fundamental length scale, which I picked to be the pressure scale height as simply being one over square root of epsilon larger than that. And so I have all the classical length scales, which are physically argued for typically in meteorology. I can relate them uh, to my fundamental length scale by the scaling parameter epsilon. And this way I can start the communication between the Potsdam Institute and the mass department, if you wish. Um, now, making everything dimensionless with these fundamental units, a reference velocity, a, the pressure scale height, et cetera, et cetera, and the pre reference pressure and temperature, I get in a dimensionless system of equations that now contains only one small parameter, which is this remaining epsilon that I mentioned, and I'm ready to do asymptotics. But now I haven't mentioned yet as um, how I, do I introduce different lengths and time scales? That's the, after all what I'm after, right? I want to introduce something, a, a system where I can study synoptic scale weather patterns as well as cloud formation on the smaller scales. So how do I do that? Basically, I do expansions in epsilon of my solution vectors. Think of U as being the density, pressure, temperature, and the velocity field and concentrations, etc. They depend on T, X, and Z, which are dimensionless time and space coordinates according to my original non-dimensionalization, and they all now depend on epsilon. And I want to do asymptotics in epsilon, so I do an expansion, uh, introducing an asymptotic sequence. This is scaling functions phi i of epsilon. The I, phi i plus one is systematically smaller than phi i, phi i. Um, and in the simplest case, it's just powers of epsilon, epsilon i, epsilon i plus one, etc. And then I have these expansion functions, and here comes how I introduce different lengths and time scales by rescaling my horizontal coordinate x, for example, with a certain power of epsilon, say epsilon squared. I systematically pick now new length scales that are by epsilon squared bigger, if this is a factor of epsilon squared, then my pressure scale. And remember, I said that X is made dimensionless by the pressure scale height of 10 kilometers. Now, a length scale that's by one over epsilon squared bigger is the synoptic scale. So by this rescaling of my X coordinate, I, I zoom into or zoom out to, to look at only the synoptic scale. And I can do this with a time scale as well. And if I take, pick the same power of epsilon, I end up with the advective time scale over the synoptic scale. And voila, I get the quasi geostrophic equation. That was the equation system in the middle of the three sets of equations I showed on the first uh, transparency. And if I pick different scalings in length and time, I can actually reproduce a whole avalanche of reduced models that I find in the textbooks and in research papers, et cetera, all with one and the same approach um, of first introducing a universal scaling, in identifying the small epsilon, then doing a non-dimensionalization of the compressible flow equations that's still universal and doesn't depend on length scales and time scales, and then doing asymptotics where I specifically can introduce the lengths and time scales as rescalings of the original coordinates. Now, this gives me a diagram where over the length and time scales, I'm, I can localize uh, all of these reduced models. The acronyms stand for planetary geostrophic, quasi geostrophic, hydrostatic primitive equations, weak temperature gradient approximations, often used for tropical atmospheres. Um, the Bussinesk model on the small scales, et cetera, et cetera. So I find all of them in such a scaling diagram. Now, when I first talked about this to meteorologists and presented this proudly to my colleagues, they said, 
And what's new? We had all these equation sets to begin with. So what did you do? This is not informative. And I told them, wait a second. I have one thing to add. Namely, I derived all of these models with one and the same distinguished limit for my original three parameters. Remember, epsilon cube, epsilon, and square root of epsilon. And I never had to change this distinguished limit when deriving either of these models. This means that all of them are compatible with one and the same distinguished limit in the parameter space. And now this means I can start doing multi-scale analysis by not looking at one time and one X and one Z vertical coordinate, but actually introducing something that looks more like, uh, let me now use the um, characteristics that I have here. I can introduce a U that depends on uh, T epsilon squared T X um, epsilon squared. No, that's not good. Epsilon, epsilon squared X, um, maybe only one Z, et cetera, et cetera, and study length and time scale interactions by systematically using technology of multi-scale analysis, WKB theory, and what have you. So, so consistently, I can now derive models that show interactions between the processes we, we seem to already know on the particular lengths and time scales, and I, and I can derive how they interact with each other across the scales. And that is, hasn't been in that way stated ever anywhere before, I believe. Just a caveat, my good friend Lu Ting from the Courant Institute, who is 98 by now, in 19, 1951 wrote a small draft paper with Joe Keller, one of the great, uh, great uh, predecessors in, in applied mathematics, on how to do exactly this. It never got published, and it was in Luting's drawers until, until 2003 when I talk, talked to him about all of this. And he said, wait a second, I have a paper here, which I wrote with Joel some time ago. At the time, the meteorologists like Charney uh, and colleagues who they talked to, they weren't interested. They thought this was all too complicated and too mathematical and asymptotics is too constraining anyway. Uh, and so they dumped it and did something else. But it could have, all of this could have started about 60 years before. <laughs> anyway, um, here's a couple of papers that came out of all of this in the sequel. And this is all not a comprehensive list of anything. It's just stuff that I got involved in with my friends and colleagues, where we have spun it forward and looked at multi-scale uh, phenomena using this machinery. And this is part one of the talk. OK. Uh, part one B. Okay, can I can I ask a question? Oh yeah, sure. Um, it's not not a very technical one. So, I think it's actually rather remarkable that all the models that were there in the literature, so the way that you phrased it, they were all correct in terms of your derivation. So, did you find anything where I mean where the sort of approximate single scale models were not correct? Actually, I haven't. That's interesting. I think it's simply that, of course, the theoreticians, theoreticians in meteorology know their game. They know what scaling is, and they know similarity theory. And basically, one way or the other, this stuff is hidden in all the papers, but it's never brought out explicitly. Yeah. I think this is, this is simply what happened. Yeah. But this is... A, this is why I'm presenting it. This is a piece of mathematics. I'm structuring the landscape. And I highlight mm -hmm. that there's a, an internal consistency between all these models, which one can now systematically harvest for making progress on multi-scale stuff. Mm -hmm. so this is what I wanted to get across. Thanks for the question. Mm -hmm. OK. And then obviously, once we do all these formal derivations, which asymptotics is typically about first in the first place. The question comes up, can we rigorously justify from a mathematical perspective, 
that these models actually are yielding systematic approximations to solutions of the compressible flow equations. That's one game that mathematics can contribute, but there's another one that's important. And this is a, a, what, what I want to highlight in the context of hydrostatic primitive equation families. And it goes back to this uh, background here for those who aren't familiar with it. Um, there's pressure waves in the atmosphere and they work, travel horizontally as well as vertically. And the vertical propagation time of an acoustic wave across the pressure scale height is about 33 seconds. And that's a lot faster than what we are interested in when we look at the weather map and interest, are interested in a weather forecast. And also the acoustic waves are really very, very weak and they don't influence the weather. So you want to get rid of them and have an equation system that you can say something about rigorously um, and that you can model probably more efficiently on the computer. And you want to get rid of these vertically propagating acoustic waves. Well, um, you do that because you have a small epsilon power here. It turns out it's my epsilon to the power seven over two. That's the ratio between these time scales. And when you take the full compressible flow equations and you want to get rid of the vertically propagating sound, you basically have to get rid of the vertical accelerations of in the vertical momentum equation. And you have to get rid of the compressibility effect one way or the other is essentially represented by these terms. And then without giving you any details of the formal derivation, you basically drop these terms and you end up with a version of what is called the primitive equations. Uh, in this case, the primitive equations of the ocean. If you want them for the atmosphere, you have to add here a row bar in the, in the divergence constraint. Now here comes the mass contribution at that stage. In 1976, Oliger and Zinström published a paper that said, if you take the hydrostatic primitive equations and you model them, uh, use them to model a flow on a finite size domain, maybe for regional weather forecasting, and you impose locally on strictly on the boundary, some boundary conditions, and they had a class of boundary conditions that they were considering and they thought were reasonable. They proved that in this, under this condition, the equations are ill posed or the problem you get is ill posed. And that was not bothering the practical weather forecast as much. They used the primitive equations anyway, produced forecasts that were OK. Uh, but this obviously is, uh, and, and obvious, um, most of the climate models are still based on the primitive equations today. Now, for climate skeptics, this is ha, the, the major point of attack, right? You can say, what? You're using the, re the hydrostatic primitive equations for climate modeling? They're ill post. We know that since 1976. You can generate any solution you want if you use these equations. Bad news. Now, Edris and colleagues, Edris Titi and his then PhD student, Chongshan Sao, proved in 2007 the first of a whole avalanche of papers that came later that under certain conditions, which are actually the ones that are being used in the practical applications in climate modeling, the equations actually are well, well posed. So you can fix the ill posedness in Oliga and Zinström by once going to the periodic conditions on the sphere, then you don't have sharp boundaries. That's one part of the resolution of the problem. Um, and there are others that come in later, in later papers. But now, so mathematics here contributes from PDE theory, a rigorous theorem that normally a climate researcher isn't really interested in because it doesn't, doesn't tell him anything about the climate, but it is of interest to him because it shows what you are doing there in the climate models, if you take a few constraints into account is actually mathematically sound and you don't get arbitrary solutions, you have a solid basis to stand on to construct your numerics, and then you can defend against that major and really fundamental criticism that somebody might come up with uh, if they wanted to and knew about Oliver and Zimstrom 76. So that's another mass contribution to climate research that isn't at all climate research per se, but helps consolidating what's being done. Second topic. 
And here is a couple of papers, again, from Edris' world and colleagues. Uh, there's a lot of research in this area by many other people that I apologize for not having listed, but uh, um, there is a lot of people who work on this. And I think they do marvelous contributions to this applied field of climate research and, and environmental research. Take home message from this part of the talk. Um, there's an asymptotic self consistency in all these models in the model hierarchy, and it prepares us for um, scale interaction theories, as I explained. The rigorous justifications of uh, these re model reductions that lend further credibility um, and these existence, stability, and uniqueness results, they support what is actually being done um, in, in weather and climate research with rigorous underpinnings. That now finally was part one of the talk. And now let me get to part two. And I might actually not get to part three or only say a few words about it because I do want to spend some time on this part. And this is about um, basically a methodology for machine learning that's quite oblique to most of the ones that you probably have seen unless you have studied Ilya Horenko and colleagues' work. And I would discuss it in the context of a concrete application, which is the prediction, database prediction of El Nino, some couple of uh, uh, 10, uh, 10 to 20 months ahead of time, based just on uh, data of sea surface temperatures over the Pacific and possibly additional data that you can extract from what is called reanalysis of ocean dynamics in this area. So the goal is in general in machine learning and some branches of statistics to reconstruct functions that go from some space X to some space Y from data that give you pairs of X's and Y's. And uh, you want to have an approximation of this uh, um, uh, function f, and you create it by learning how to best somehow reproduce the pairs x, y of t with your approximate function. And then hopefully you have techniques to validate or corroborate that what you have learned as a function uh, actually uh, is robust against exchanging the data from which you train the model with those you test against and so on and so forth. So you want to learn a function from data. That's basically what's behind machine learning. In the, in the concrete case that we have here, we want to learn a function that takes in uh, surface temperature measurements, say 100 measurements of temperature of the sea surface in the, in the Pacific region, and some 100 additional degrees of freedom of a vertical slice uh, in the ocean, uh, through the ocean near the equator, and you want to predict from it an index or a probability of finding what is called uh, the Nino 3 4 index being one, zero, or minus one. What does it mean? The Nino 3 4 index is the following um, it's the um, uh, when the sea surface temperature averaged over this Pacific region over five months exceeds the long-term mean temperature in the same region by more than 0.4 degrees Celsius, then you say it's an El Nino. If this number of this mean temperature is my, colder than my, the mean minus 0.4 Celsius, it's a La Nina event, and everything in between closer to 0.4 degrees um, to the long-term average, then you have none of the two. And so you want to learn a function that predicts the probability of getting a number that's uh, a, a menu index that's bigger than 0.4 degree uh, away from the mean. Okay, that's a function we want to learn. And you want to learn it, um, today plus n months ahead, and n months can be something like 10. This is where the current uh, physically based models, not database models, have their difficulties 
uh, and start falling on their nose. There is a paper by Ham et al. Uh, in Nature in 2019, uh, who actually by deep learning technology achieved some reasonable predictions for 16 months, which is quite a feat. And I'll show what comes of uh, other technologies later in the talk. So this is the machine learning task and the principal um, task of machine learning. Now, let me say something about the fact that typically you deal with even many more than 100 or 200 degrees of freedom when you want to learn such a function. Typically, you have very high dimensional uh, functions that you want to learn. Now, this, what I'm going to mention here, it goes under the notion of the curse of dimensionality. And let me explain what's behind that. So <clears throat> suppose we want, were to just take 100 measurements of sea surface temperature every six hours over 30 years and store it away as our database for learning a function. How many individual temperature measurements would we have? Well, it's an easy calculation, about 5 million. Sounds like a lot of data, but it's not big data at all, as I will show you in a minute. Now we have a space from which we take our argument of the function, which is 100 dimension, right? We have 100 individual temperature measurements. If you just were to take the unit cube in 100 dimensions, like that's the cube we know, we take for a dice uh, in 3D, we take the ana analog of that in 100 dimensions. And we wanted to simply define a multilinear function on the unit cube in 100 dimensions. Guess how many degrees of freedom we would have to determine? Well, it's the number of corners of the unit cube in D dimensions. D is, D is 100, so the number is two to the power 100, and that is 1.3 times 10 to the 13. So that's about 10 to the five times the number of data that we have. Oops, so if you want to ever learn a function in 100 dimensions that's reasonably, gen reasonably generic and really depends on 100 degrees of freedom, forget about it. We will not learn it ever because we can't even store that number on any computer. Okay, so ha. Huh. If our machine learning technology does give us good approximations, obviously to the, we can empirically see that they often give very good approximation. Some magic has to happen, which is that there is a drastic and systematic dimension reduction behind the scenes that we don't know about and don't see for that to happen. But we will never learn a function in 100 dimensions that's reasonably, reasonably generic. Now, let me remind you of the first part of the talk. When you do all this dimension reduction analytically, the key point of scientific insight when you go from the general case to the a scale demand dependent reduced model is what are the key degrees of freedom? Once you know those, you actually have a lot of physical insight gained. So this magical dimension reduction that we see here, that's actually where the science is. And I don't like any methodology of machine learning that doesn't help me find out what are the reduced degrees of freedom. Because that's where the science is. And if it's all happening in a black box, I'm very skeptical about it. Let me move on from this. So in summary here, we have Generically, we have small data problems in, in the climate research area, and we are looking for dimension reductions in order to still be able to learn something from these many dimensional data sets. Okay, now comes an introduction to the technology that Ilya Horenko and his colleagues uh, invented over the past five years, roughly. 
Um, it started in 2018 um, and is going on. So this is um, SPA stands for sparse probabilistic approximation. And this is basically what I'm doing here on this transparency. So suppose we have now sketched in 2D because it's easy to do on a screen, we have a point of data. That's a data set that think of them as being our temperature measurements, populating their, their argument space. And the first step Ilya and company do is very similar to what um, clustering techniques do or k-means algorithms do, namely find a representation of the data set that is already reduced. Find out what are important similarities between the data so I can cluster them and don't have to always access all the data, but access certain reference data points that already incorporate the essence of much of the data that's in there. In typical, typical clustering, this is why I sketched it this way, you would think of this is a cluster, that's a cluster, and this is a cluster. Uh, K-means algorithm would place, would place a reference point in here and another in here and another in here and say, okay, I'm thinking of these as being similar to that point, these data being similar to that point, and these being similar to this point. And then I have clusters and I basically now work with um, groups of data that belong to one cluster. But we don't do um, that approach here, but rather we do, um, I will make this slightly differently this way. Okay, it's quicker. We do the sparse probabilistic approximation here. And what does it do? Basically it says, I want to uh, introduce reference points. Those are the uh, colored circled points out here in this picture. Reference points and probabilistic weights that sum up to unity for any, any given time uh, over K, such that I can approximate any, any data point by a sum of probabilistic weight times a reference point. Okay, so it's a convex combination because of probabilistic approximation, the gammas sum up to unity. So it's a convex combination of the data reference points that I would like to use in order to approximate my data points. Okay, in 2D, that's actually trivial because you draw a simplex around a, tri a triangle around all the data points. And then you know, you can actually make this zero. The error is zero because by a convex combination of the edge points, you can reach any point inside. So it's not yet all, the, all that exciting. But nevertheless, this is the first task to do. Um, and, and you want to minimize this convex interpolation error. And it, the technology is called probabilistic approximation because it's done by this convex combination idea. And now if the number of reference points is actually the number of dimensions plus one, you can always put a simplex around all your data and you can always get all the data uh, complete. That's not so interesting. Though. Okay. What's more interesting is actually, let me first go in the wrong direction and then come back to what we really want. So the wrong direction is we make K even bigger. Then something interesting happens. If you make K even bigger and you say, I want the reference points to actually be as small, as, 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 as closely together as I can possibly do under a certain, uh, with, with a cer under a certain penalty of the approximation error, then I can start capturing nonlinear manifolds in a data space. Right? So in, I, I, I have to invest more data points, but now I can capture this nonlinear arrangement of the data in my, in my high dimensional space or in my two dimensional space in this case. So having in principle more reference points than the dimension I want to capture, I can actually start creating simplified um, clustering type um, uh, clouds subclouds of the data, which 
in total arrange along nonlinear manifolds. So admittedly, this was going in the wrong direction because I made the cluster points even bigger and um, that's not what we want. We want a smaller thing, but at the same time, we want to take into account that the, the true dimension of the functions we learn, hopefully, and if we can learn anything at all, will be smaller than D. And here comes the next step, which is entropy optimal discrimination of, in this, in the original paper, uh, it was uh, the discrimination of statistical outliers, but here it is um, actually the reduction of dimension in the, in, the, in the state space. So in addition to um, uh, this, this distance penalty, which I neglect for the moment, we now say if a data dimension in, in what we do is turns out not to be important for what we want to learn, in, in, in our final approximation problem, we want to discriminate and downweight this dimension. So instead of taking the usual square distance when measuring distance between our approximated and actual data points, we, we downweight, we allow ourselves to downweight some of the dimensions judiciously by multiplying the square uh, of that that component of the vector, uh, downweighting it by a probabilistic weight WD, which sums up to unity and is the WDs are in zero one. And obviously we don't want to discriminate in a biased fashion. We want to do it in as unbiased a fashion as possible. And that means we use a, a, a penalty that's actually the entropy of the of the probabilistic distribution of this of this weight distribution. We maximize the entropy of the weights in order to do this discrimination. discrimination. And Ilya used this technology in order to find statistical outliers in a general statistical approach. But we can also use this to actually uh, discriminate unimportant dimensions in the total learning problem that we want to address. Okay, so I have another slide which I can explain later on uh, what is uh, information entropy, but <clears throat> let's take it for the moment <clears throat> that this is a way to find among many distributions the one that is statistically least biased. It has the, le the least uh, amount of prejudice it built into it. Now, I can use the same formula here to actually compare two distributions, namely a given distribution W that I think is the truth with another distribution um, that I find to be approximate and that is supposed to be a good approximation. So I can measure the, the entropy of the true distribution um, and compare it with the statistical average of log of one or, or log of the uh, of the the approximate distribution. Now, basically, what this means is we compare the information gain that we get from the event D under the true versus the information gained for the event D under the approximate distribution. That's what this pullback Leibler distance or divergence approximates. And it turns out to be zero only if W is the same distribution like V, and it's always larger or equal to zero. So if you misassess uh, the true distribution, you always get a positive number out here. So if you minimize the kullback liber divergence in the search for a, uh, an approximate probability distribution, what you do is you try to approximate the true one. That's what we use this for. Now, having that, we can now finally formulate um, a learning problem for the probability of finding an any new event. Okay, where is the Nino probability? Why is there a probability distribution hidden in here? Well, right? basically think of the following. For a given data point, we, in hindsight, we have what happened n months later. We know what, whether an El Nino occurred or not. So we can assign a one um, to 
La Nina happened, a one to La Nina happened, or a one to um, nothing happened, which means that we get for each the uh, El Nino, nothing happened, or La Nina, we get a probability distribution as a reference, which is the trivial distribution having either zero um, or one, but it is a probability distribution. And now we want to learn this distribution, okay? By creating a uh, an approximate probability distribution. Well, how do we do that in this case? We already have our concept for a reduced data space representation with the reference points and the probabilistic weights. Now, in addition, we want to assign a probability of El Nino to each of the reference points, xk circle, and then use this same probabilistic weighting to, uh, to find or represent the probability of El Nino occurring um, given a, a new point that has the convex con combination weights gamma. So gamma, the sum over gamma k times the probabilities of El Nino occurring at the, for the reference point, um, that's what our probabilistic uh, pro, uh, approximate probability distribution will look like. So um, we now want to have the, the best possible assignment of probabilities to the reference points. So we minimize the, um, uh, the, the kullback liber divergence between the uh, database true probability and our approximate one. That's what we want to do, minimize the Kullback library divergence um, over all the uh, time points. Um, and that's part of the optimization problem. Once we have the gammas here, uh, our superposition weights and the reference points. And this whole thing now get, goes into one beautiful minimization problem, which in contrast to what most of the time happens, or oftentimes happens in, uh, in these uh, learning procedures, you oftentimes first try to cluster up your data space and then introduce um, your approximation to the function that you want to find. Here it's done differently. The, the clustering or the reduction of state space representation is done in one problem together with finding the approximation for the learned to be learned function. And by the way, discriminating unimportant dimensions by putting the penalty of the entropy distribution. And so this whole reduct model reduction problem, I like it very much because each term in the formula tells me exactly what's behind it. I know what's behind it. This is a data space approximation with this weighted square distance. This is systematic dimension reduction. And this is my way of approximating a probability or Ilya's way of uh, approximating a probability distribution. And I don't do them separately because I know this is all a linked problem and I want to do for my data set the best possible I can do. So I have to actually find at the same time the reference points the probabilistic superposition weights, the discrimination of dimensions, and the probabilities of El Nino assigned to the reference points. Now you might say, oh my God, this is a non-convex, complicated, never to be solved numerically minimization problem, and there's no hope we ever get through this. Comes the latest paper of Ilya and company um, by Vecchi et al, where they say, ah, we can actually compromise on this year. Instead of actually minimizing the pullback Leiber divergence, we can replace log of lambda gamma by the weighted superposition of log of lambda. Looks like a crime, but it turns out you can prove rigorously that this is an upper bound on the true pullback Libra divergence. So basically, when you minimize this instead of pull up Libra, you at least have minimized an upper bound for this piece. And once you are through with that, magic happens. You can now define a sequential solver that freezes 
first the weights, no, first Wx and lambda and computes the superposition weights, then freezes the other three and computes the discrimination weights, and then freezes, et cetera, et cetera. You cycle through individual split step optimizations, and it turns out you can actually solve each of these separate problems analytically. So solving each of the subproblems is trivial. You basically have the formula, you implement it, and you have it. And so the, you only have to make sure, and this is possible too, that the iterative process boils down in one cycle actually to a Newton algorithm or the Newton-like optimization algorithm. Then suddenly we're not talking about stochastic gradient descent, which is at most first order, uh, first order convergent. We're talking about the Newton method, which is quadratic in convergence. So this converges extremely rapidly. And then you have a method of learning an linear probability 24 months ahead with really good results. I skipped this slide, but I want to show you some comparisons Ilya and company did between their methodology and alternatives in the literature. And they used a number of uh, um, uh, models, generalized um, uh, K-means models, for example, versions of neural networks, um, uh, deep learning technologies, etc. Support vector machines, sparse gener generalized linear models, and so on and so forth. And here is a comparison of the mean prediction quality on El Nino. And you can see that there's only a few competitors that in quality are up to this level in the area under curve uh, um, uh, criterion, which is a standard one in machine learning. I don't want to explain it here, but it turns out, <clears throat> so this is only the sparse GLM, the um, support vector machine here, and the deep neural network, and the sparse probabilistic approximation, they achieve formally this level of accuracy. Now, when you look at the cost, computational cost, you see that the three competitors of SPA, namely GLM, uh, um, SVM, and deep learning are all in the range of 10 to the power two in terms of computational cost. Minutes, uh, seconds of compute time on a laptop uh, for this problem. And the SPA is down here. It's, it's a thousand times faster. And this is for a problem that's not really that big. If you go to much, much bigger problems, like you're having not a hundred dimensions, but a thousand and more dimensions, the, the gap opens up even wider. In another paper, they report on a million times difference between compute times for deep neural network training and SPA. And that means the difference between a laptop and a supercomputer. And I recommend reading their papers. Um, in terms of, uh, this is in terms of quality and cost. And if you actually look at predictions here, the comparison of the ESPA procedure with um, a, an LSTM accuracy optimal deep learning prediction that they uh, had here, it's not the most cost efficient. And it turns out the, the red spots follow pretty much the gray curve, which is the data. And the best deep neural network they could get still has a lot of outliers in the regions where there is no El Nino happening. And by the way, here you see the practical dimension reduction out of the degrees of freedom, one, 200 degrees of freedom they had for the temperature measurements. Actually, it was, um, uh, um, it was uh, uh, principal component, principal components of temperature measurements. And similarly for uh, data from a vertical slice of, of ocean temperatures, from the 200 dimensions, only a few are outside of a probabilistic weight of WD larger than uh, two, uh, 2 hundredths. And those are the effective degrees of freedom that you see. And you can now go back and see what are the patterns that come up and can you understand why those have an influence on El Nino and why not. So in that sense, it gives a very strong indicator to theoreticians to now look at why the heck is it that these few degrees of freedoms actually have such seem to have such an impact on El Nino on it. Okay. Um, take home message here, small data problems are ubiquitous in geosciences. The current deep learning 
and statistical concepts might not be the best in high dimensions. Uh, high dimension, small data dimension reduction is actually an approximation problem and not a statistical problem. I haven't talked much about it, but it's important to understand that. Information theory is a uni universal tool to phrase these approximation problems in a global fashion, putting everything in one box together uh, as one optimization problem. And then um, analysis, scrutinizing analysis of the resulting optimization problem can actually help dramatically in saving costs and actually not only compute time, but also energy in feeding the computers, which is becoming a non-trivial issue nowadays where everybody is launching deep neural networks that gobble up compute time like crazy all the time. Okay, here is a few references to recent papers of the group that I reported upon. And uh, this is the end of the second talk. And I believe I'm running out of time. Um, I had a few 